In this section, we're going to be looking at how to analyze a work using the elements and the principles of design. There are other ways to look at artworks, such as style and media, but we'll be focusing on number one and two, as shown on the screen. So let's look at visual elements first. These are also called the formal elements. They include line, space, light and value, color, shape, volume, and texture. Starting with line, what does line do when you look at this work? So you can start asking yourself questions such as, does this line lead your eye anywhere across the image? For example, does your eye follow the line horizontally? perhaps following the white line near the top from left to right and back again. Or perhaps the lines of the triangle near the center leads your eye up diagonally through the image. You can also ask yourself, are the lines broken or solid? Are the outlines thick, thin? Do they define shapes such as the squares, rectangles, circles, and triangles that we see? Do they connect or do they divide things? In many ways, the lines in this work seem to divide the bands of color. And are the lines loose or controlled? There are more questions you can ask in this, but this is just the beginning and how to think about line. This is A Starry Night by Van Gogh. You may not know this, but Van Gogh was an avid pen and ink drawer and he sketched constantly. What is really interesting about this drawing is that he draws the same way he paints in these little broken lines that lead the eye around the image. So if you look at the sky, you actually go on a visual journey as you follow the broken lines from left to right and then swirling around and then back again. Another way to think of line is how something is drawn and oriented. So for example, this image is a painting called The Death of Socrates. And the artist David, when he first began thinking of this composition, he started working on a grid, which you can see at the top right. And if you notice, the postures and the arms of his main character, Socrates, very much follow the vertical and horizontal lines of a grid. And looking at the painting, you'll see there's a lot of horizontals in the back, uh, in the bricks, and there's verticals, there's horizontals in the stones of the floor, and uh, just throughout, horizontals and verticals are predominant. Well, if you look at an artist such as Delacroix, this is a painting called Death of Sardanapalus. And uh, you can see peeking out at the top his idea of a preparatory sketch, which doesn't have a single vertical or horizontal line at all. In fact, all the lines are curvaceous, they are dynamic, they uh, fold in one onto the other, they serpentine. Uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of sort of active line that is in constant movement. And it's a very interesting contrast between this one and the work of David that we looked at before. There's also sort of a, a line of sight. So although in this work called Mademoiselle de Avignon by Picasso, uh, I have inserted these black lines to show you that there is a line of sight that is created by the direction that the figures in the artwork are looking. So just for example, the image in the middle, the lady, she's actually looking at us. We are in her line of sight. While the two figures to the left and to the right, one is looking horizontally across to the right side, while the lady on the right is looking diagonally down and to the left. So. I don't know if you've ever looked at someone who's looking up at the sky and you instinctively look at the sky yourself, even though uh, you're not sure why. Well, it's because we tend to look at things that other people are looking at. And, and there is a implied line that's created by the direction we look that as humans, we tend to follow. The next element we're going to look at is space. So what you could start thinking about is, is the space positive or negative, which we'll look at in a moment. Is it a deep space or a shallow space? 
Then the question is, how is space created? How does the artist imply on a flat canvas that there is actually a sense of space? So there's different ways that artists can do this. They can overlap images. Obviously, if one thing's in front of another, we know that there is a sense of space. Uh, larger objects are put at the front, smaller objects near the back. And the use of linear perspective, which is in the image below, which means that as things recede from us in space, they start to narrow towards a vanishing point. And that suggests as well that there is a sense of space. So if you look at this image, we're not looking at line of sight, we're looking at this image in terms of space. And you'll notice that if you look down where the lady's feet are, there seems to be a very narrow strip upon which these women are standing. They're not standing in a large open room, but rather on a thin band of floor, which suggests to us that there's a very shallow space in which they're standing. With positive and negative space mentioned before, Basically, positive space is the thing, the objects. For example, this yellow vase. You are positive space as you stand in a room. Negative space is all the space around the object. So it is the space around the vase, or it is the space around you as you stand in that room. What's interesting about negative space is it too can have shape and meaning. For example, in this vase illustration called Rubens vase, you'll notice that there are two profiles on either side of the vase's contours. The negative space is making a shape. Do you see that? The next thing we're going to look at is light and value. Value basically means from light to dark, so it's the gray scale. Light and dark, or value, creates interest in work. It often can create contrast. So think of a scene where something's in dark shadow, but the side of a face is illuminated in bright light. This creates drama, a sense of action about to happen. When there's a low contrast or very little variation in value, the image seems to be more flat and less dynamic. We also associate things such as light with life, energy, day, while we associate dark with death, sadness, and night. The next element we're going to look at is color. Complementary colors basically are the colors opposite each other on the color wheel. So if you look at red, you'll notice the color directly opposite is green. Opposite blue, we have orange, and opposite yellow, we have purple. If we go back to this painting by Picasso, you'll notice that he has used the complementary colors of orange and blue in his work. The next element we're going to look at is shape. So ask yourself questions such as, is the shape organic and natural? Or is it geometric and man-made? Is it a solid shape? Is it outlined? Think about these things. For example, when you look at this work by Picasso, are these the natural shapes that you expect to see in women? Or has he created unusual shapes in his compositions? The next element is volume. Volume basically means, does the shape look as if it's two-dimensional? three-dimensional and how did the artist do this if you look on the right of the screen you'll see an orb the artist has shaded the bottom left to look like it's in shadow and allowed for highlights in the top right so that this orb looks like a three-dimensional ball sitting on a table if you look below that you'll see the shape of a circle it's just a gray flat shape no volume has been implied on the shape so it is two-dimensional. If you look at the Venus in the painting provided, the artist has gone to paint to suggest that she is a three-dimensional woman. Do you see the highlights and the shading that he's put into her body to make her look three-dimensional? The next element is texture. Texture can be something that you can actually touch or it can be visual. It can be rough or smooth, soft or hard, prickly, bumpy, a whole range of different words can describe it. This painting actually has straw stuck onto it. And so you know that if you were to touch it, it, was, it would have a very sort of bumpy, rough texture. But visually, there's also texture to it. We can look at it and see that it's not smooth. 
We're going to quickly look at principles of design now. So we looked at the elements and now we're looking at the principles. Principles of design are often what interior decorators use when they're trying to create rooms that are vis visually pleasing. So we look at things such as scale, proportion, rhythm, emphasis, unity and variety and balance. Let's go over those quickly. Proportion and scale often get confused. So let's explain it this way. Firstly, does the image appear to be the correct size? So if you look at the spoon, is the spoon the right size? That is its scale. Well, the answer is no. It's huge. It's a very large sculpture by the artist Oldenburg. And we know that is not the right scale. It is too big. Looking at proportion, we can ask ourselves, how do the different elements of the work relate to each other? So, is the cherry the right size in proportion to the spoon? And the answer is probably yes. I believe that in real life you could have a spoon and a cherry that relate similarly in regards to one another. So scale is really relating to the size of something compared to how we know it should be, while proportion is relating different elements of something together to see if they work together. Rhythm is something that leads the eye around a composition. Uh, similar to line, it's something that allows our eye to travel around a work. So you'll notice that not only is line used here to lead our eye up and down, left and right, but there's patterns, there's repeating patterns of colors and shapes that help us to follow, for example, the blue rectangles from left to right, perhaps down, and then back to the left side of this particular pattern. Rhythm is used extensively in architecture. So for example, you'll notice that there are columns at the top that lead our eye not only up and down, but we can follow them left to right back again. There is also a rose window, which is the round window in the center. This leads our eyes in a circular motion. Then at the bottom, we have again columns as well as statues. And the repetition of these items helps lead our eyes on the horizontal. Here's an example of line used with rhythm. The rhythm is the fact that the line is broken into a pattern. So it's an example of how actually our eyes do automatically follow rhythm. Emphasis could also be called the focal point. What is being emphasized in an artwork? How and why? So for example, um, the Madonna and child in this work are much larger than the saints and angels on either side. They are disproportionate in size. There is also the use of rhythm. If you notice, there's repeating patterns, not of, only of humans and circles, but there's also stairs leading up to the mother, as well as the shape of the triangle above the heads of the Madonna and child that sort of create a border that brings our eyes to the center. You'll also notice in regards to value that the Madonna has the darkest robe. So our eyes are drawn to the darkest thing often or the lightest thing in an image. Can you see any other ways that the artist has emphasized the Madonna and child in this work? Unity and variety is one that a lot of people get wrong and it is confusing. The way I like to describe it is it's talking about what keeps the work together so it's not just a like mishmash of craziness but there's enough variety in the work to make it interesting so i describe it as a salad often we th know a salad is a salad because it's usually got lettuce it sort of gives us the clue this is salad so i think of the lettuce or the spinach as the unity the variety is the the fun stuff that we put in the salad to make it really yummy. In this case, it would be the avocado, the cheese, the olives, the tomato. So looking at this work, it is actually a collage of newspaper clippings. So what would be the unity? Well, the unity would be that the whole work is made up of newspaper clippings, um, at, which are similar in color. The, the newspaper has faded and, and aged, so it's gone sort of that um, that orange color. Uh, and, and throughout, we see a contrast of lights and darks. So the artist has continued with that. We also see a repetition of both human faces and bodies. 
words as well as signs of industrialism like wheels and cogs. So there's unity there that's giving us a cohesive narrative. But what makes it interesting so it's not boring? Well, the artist has left some open spaces. The artist has used different sizes. Some heads are large, some are small. Uh, There's a variety of different industrial machinery. So we're not just seeing the same cog over and over again. We're seeing different things. The words are different. Although we see data, we also see other words uh, in, in there. And you'll also notice that the artist has sparingly used the color blue just to kind of attract our eye. So that would be how we would sort of identify unity and variety in this image. Balance is really important in design. Um, I know with interior decorators, it's the kind of, it's the idea of sort of putting two throw cushions on either end of of a sofa. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because visually we like balance. Balance is safe and predictable and it usually makes us happy. Here's an example of visual balance. If you look at the image below of the rocks, as far as weight goes, they're actually balancing. But visually, one side is heavier than the other. Which side is that? Well, it's the right side. There's several reasons. One could be that, well, there's two rocks instead of one, so we immediately visually feeling that that should be heavier. Also, the the top rock is leaving a shadow on the bottom rock, and that shadow is of a dark value. So we're immediately picking up on that darkness. So we're going to look at three different types of balance. The first one is symmetrical. Symmetrical pretty much means you could cut it down the middle and it would be identical, mirror image on either side, such as the Taj Mahal. Asymmetrical balance means visually it's still balanced, but it's not a mirror image. So in this trip to here, you can see that there are different scenes happening on the left and the right panels. But as a whole, no one side feels heavier than the other. And the third kind of balance is radial. This is an example of a rose window. And radial means that the balance really works throughout. So you could cut this anywhere as if it were a pizza and you would have this sense of mirror image. And this mirror image actually radiates from the center out. So going back to the image of the rocks here, visually this image is not balanced. It is imbalanced because our eye is drawn to one side more than the other. So I'm going to leave you with this image. I'm going to ask you just on a piece of paper as a way to actively use the information you've just heard. I want you to try and describe this work in terms of line, both the line that you see as well as implied line. If you were to divide it down the center, would one side feel heavier than the other, or is it somehow balanced out? I also want you to see as far as value goes, what is the darkest and what is the lightest part of this work, and how does that help with emphasis? How does that draw our eye to the thing that the artist wants us to focus on? Try it out. See if you can do it. If not, and you're struggling with these concepts, please contact me through a discussion board on DC Connect. And feel free to ask questions so that we can work on getting through this together, as it's important that you understand these concepts, as they'll be included in some of your activities and graded assignments during the semester. I hope you found this presentation helpful.